Welcome back to Visited by Voices Live. I'm joined tonight by a personal hero, someone who I think has made one of the biggest impacts in horror fiction over the last three decades or so, Miss um, Kathy Koja. Hi, everybody. So starting in the early 90s, um, you really started to come to prominence with uh, novels in the Del Abyss line. Uh, first Cypher, which was a both Stoker and uh, Lod Locus uh, award-winning novel for you. That had to be a pretty big way to start a career. It was fun. It was, it was an interesting way to come into publishing. And I had, um, I had gone to the Clarion writing workshop um, four or five years before that. And that's when I started writing fiction seriously and publishing stories seriously. And my first agent, um, when I showed him what was going to become the cipher, he said, well, you know, Kathy, if you have the balls to write this, I have the balls to sell it. And he did. And it was a lot of fun to lead off a line that you know, obviously we didn't know it was going to become so iconic, but you could tell by the quality of so many of the writers that Gene Cavellis had assembled that it was going to be something special. And we had a lot of fun. So for those who don't know, Del Abyss was an early 90s imprint of Dell Publishing, which uh, specialized in horror, but it was a specific bent of horror. It was not retracing the steps of the previous decade, which had been an explosive decade for horror, but it had also been very codified and very commercial. And this was a, a much more creative and uh, more of a punk rock attitude almost to the horror genre in that as long as you brought, as long as you brought the goods, you, anything went. And um, so I say anything, but not exactly anything. The original title of that novel was The Fun Hole. How did that conversation yeah. go? Well, I lost, you know, um, it's, it's interesting at first I was, I under, you know, obviously I understand it was a, a you know, Della wasn't, Abyss was an imprint with a large corporate house and it is understandable at the time I was probably a little more surprised than I would be now, but I really grew to like the title of the cipher because the more you look at the idea of the void, the nothing, the, the main character, Nicholas, he has lots of problems. And in many ways, you know, he's the cipher in that story. The hole's the cipher in that story, the fun hole. I think it's a better title than I thought it was then. So I have, have grown to love it through the years. Well, and, and, it does. and it's... it's it's reissue. I mean, that was the time for me to pull out the old title again, but I like the cipher now and I'm, I'm pleased with it. It's a pretty iconic title in horror literature at this point. I don't think you could, I, I, as much yeah. as you might want to, I don't think, um, I mean, again, yeah. it won two of the biggest fantasy writing, uh, you know, literature awards imaginable. And beyond that, I mean, the reviews were stellar for that book. Uh, I, I remember basically reading all of the horror press at the time, and it was a title that just kept coming up to the point where it pushed me to the bookstore and I picked it up. And it made me trust Abyss as a line. And I'm glad it did because so many of my favorite writers, not just of the time period, but in general, came out of that line. So you you birthed something in me personally. And as a young writer yeah. who wanted to follow a muse from a distance you were saying no it's possible 
don't settle for just wanting to imitate someone else. Don't settle for just writing the, you know, at that point codified Stephen King, Dean Kuntz plot, which might've been very commercial, but had been done. Um, but so you spent the first half of the nineties pretty consistently putting out a novel a year, except for in 95, correct? Because you have bad brains. Um, yeah, because kink came out in 96. So right. yeah. So that's a, an extraordinary period of creative creativity and output for any writer. A book a year is not a simple thing, and books a year of that kind of quality is frankly amazing. So yeah, how, how did I mean, you do it? I, I, I accept the compliment, but I also, I mean, this is my job. This is what I do. So there have been years when I have not written a book a year um but it, um, and i should be writing a book a year i should be or at least should be giving a year to a project and and seeing it through you know however long it takes um the i did a string of ya novels for ferris strauss and Giroux, um and those were a book a year those were seven books and the under the poppy trilogy that came after that took a little bit longer and i started to do immersive um, theater work, uh, event work. And so those were, I was doing two shows a year. I mean, if it's your job, you should do your job every day. So and I, the project that I'm working on now, Dark Factory, has taken me longer than a year to write the book, but that's because there, it has a lot of ancillary. Um, it's something completely new. I've never done anything like it before. So it took a minute <laughs> to find my footing. But yeah, I mean, if you're, if this is your job. You're supposed to do your job. Uh, well, you know, but I take all the. I mean, I take the compliment on my work ethic. I appreciate it. But, well, I'm just thinking. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it is. The, I, 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 that's to me. That is the problem with people looking at creativity, quote unquote, from the outside and saying, "Oh, you know, this is." I mean, I'm kind of at war with that idea anyway. Creativity is a mindset. It's not a product. It, one of the most creative people I know was for many years a nurse in a nursing home. And she did nothing but try to figure out new ways to do her job and new ways to bring enrichment to her patients and new ways to make things easier. She's one of the most creative people I've ever known. But if you say oh, you're a very creative nurse. You know, people are like, no, creative means you produce like a thing, a piece of art, whatever. Not true, not true. And making this kind of work, that's why when you see any, almost any artist or writer or musician, you know, biopic, which is a word I hate, but we'll use it anyway. 90% of the time, people are working their ass off if they are producing something worthwhile they're practicing they're working they're writing they're in the studio they're in the studio they're in the studio and that's really boring to watch in a in a film but that's that's what it takes to get it done you have to get your ass to work every day like you would any other job yeah and i think it was a great period too because there was there was real book sales uh, uh, out there at that time it was a, a good period for book sales. Um, I think it was a great support for someone like yourself who had so much to offer to the genre. Um, I, I, I think that you underestimate your, your uh, impact in some ways hearing you talk because you're modest. But in reality, I think that um, you opened a door for a lot of people and held the door open by the way. That's what I meant by the first half of the decade of book a year is uh, it wasn't just you kicked in the door and then that was it. It was like you held open that door and a lot of people came in behind you. And for those of us who were re visiting the bookstore all the time and we saw the either the Del Abyss label or something um, later, a little bit later on, the Borderlands anthology from Thomas Monteleone, whereas you start to see those names from that class of horror writers come in. To me, you were you were the gateway drug. You were the one who I discovered and it really opened up my mind about what could happen. And I know I am not as big an exception as you might think. I think you did it for a lot of people. And I think it's, 
a lot of what Della Biss did and what Jean Cavellos did, and Jean doesn't get nearly enough credit for the work that she did and the willingness that she had to try new things. Um, the first two, the artist for my first two books of Della Biss, Marshall Arisman, is a fabulous artist and works wonderfully well in a horror genre, but had maybe not been thought of before. And she was open to, she was open to doing things and she was also willing to put in again, the work, the hard work. And publishing has changed immeasurably since those days. But when you have an editor who's really behind what you're doing, you have a publisher who's really behind what you're doing, that's irreplaceable. And I've seen that throughout my career, depending on you know who I'm working with. Uh, my YA books were the Francis Foster imprint. And because it was Francis's imprint, very much like Jean, she had the power to you know acquire and the power to enforce some of her ideas without a ton of hierarchy over her. And that makes a huge difference because it is a business. I mean, it's a business. You have to you have to make money or you can't sell it. If you don't sell books, you're not going to be in business and you won't make any money. And you it's can't a commercial buy art. books from writers. It's a commercial right? art. There's no question about it. Show and, business, right? But I think that's a good thing ultimately um, because I think that if there wasn't a commercial aspect to it, it almost um, all the compelling aspects probably would get lost in the mix. I think it is a good place to be that it came out of the stages of Europe as stage plays into film. In, and you talk about the great literature of literature, really a lot of it was from the genre directly or indirectly. Cause, because I think horror is a direct descendant of the Greek tragedy ultimately. And I, I think that. Sure. Cause it's, it turns on that catharsis. Right. Access, right? It's but I think it's remained a little bit. I think it's gone through the ages a little bit more purely than a lot of genres have, and I think that that's the interesting thing about horror, and that's why I think it does remain commercially viable in a variety of formats. I mean, we're living in a time where there's more fiction and film and music and comic book that and video games produced inside the genre than any other time. I mean. There is no, you could not possibly consume all of it if you wanted to. Right. And that's not, that hasn't always been true. I wanted to ask because we were talking about great editors in the past and working with other people who really tried to push the genre forward. And you are in a, I think uh, we've been in, you have been in several seminal anthologies providing short stories. Um, but in particular, the Outsiders anthology from Nancy Holder and Nancy Kilpatrick. Yeah. That, that's that a book. super cool book. Oh my that's God, yes. Book. So there is not a story in that anthology that misses. It is it is just amazing quality. And it was, see, seeing your name was part of the selling point for me, but seeing, but picking up that book and reading through it, I, did, I, I, I finished the book and I started again. And that doesn't happen with me. I always have a digestion period. So did you have any uh, stories about how that book came to, came to you or did you just submit or were you invited? Nancy asked me, Nancy Holder asked me and I pretty much do anything Nancy Holder says. I, I think Nancy is just the bomb. And yeah, I was, I think it's a really, it's an indication of something that could be very tired or very, you know, outsiders, uh, whatever. But they made it completely new. And they were not afraid to stretch the definition. And I think that's the, the worry for any genre. Um, when you want, you want to give people who are longtime fans or longtime consumers you want to be able to give them what they come there for, but you need to be, like you said, keep opening the doors, keep opening the doors, keep opening the doors. So different people will come in and that, because otherwise you risk becoming, you know, sclerotic where your, your creative arteries just fill up with plaque and it's the same thing over and over and over again. Then it's just ritualistic and 
there's no way out of that. So on the other hand, and I'm not picking on this book at all because I do think it is a very good book, but it's in such a different vein and it's a vein that I never considered you part of. Maybe I'm wrong and I'd love you to tell me I'm wrong, but uh, you were in Splatterpunks 2, th that anthology. I was. And I don't, I, it never seemed to make any sense to me. <laughs> were you a fan of that movement or... I was a fan of some of the people in it. I'm a big fan of John Skip. I think John is a wonderful writer and a untiring champion of the genre and the people who write it and the people who film it. And he has a, just a ton of lore. And I think John is a remarkable ambassador for the horror genre in general and particular. Um, no, I'm not necessarily, I think because of the, when did that book come out? When did the uh, anthology come out? I want to say late nineties. I don't, I didn't put it in my notes. I have a copy in the other room, but I'm not going to leave. Right. To go I don't know either. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's in the other room. Um, no, I, I would think that because of some of the you know gooey stuff in my work there could be a case made and you know again genre genre and the striations of genre are in the eye of the beholder and i would not say no to if that's what people read and see in the work that i'm, I'm doing that's not a problem for me i'm not going to complain about that however wherever your taste and my work coincide, if there's a receptor for what I'm doing, I don't care what you name it. If, if we can have that conversation, because I really, fiction is useless. All art is useless if it's not a conversation. If I don't have a response to what you're doing as a filmmaker or a musician or whatever, if I don't have some kind of buy-in emotional response or intellectual response, it's, I don't care how well other people like it. It doesn't work for me. I don't have that receptor. And that's the same. Any of my books, if people have the receptors for it, then they will enjoy it because we'll be able to have that conversation. And if they don't, no harm, no foul. So I'm going to move from that to something I'm going to absolutely champion from you, which is your new collection, Velocities. Yay. Velocities. I'm so excited about Velocities. I you should not had be. a short fiction collection out for like 10 billion years. And yeah, and, I, <laughs> and this was my, my first experience with uh, the mighty Meerkat Press, who is bringing out the Cypher reprint later this year. So yeah, I'm very happy with this book. I'm very happy with Meerkat. So, and again, don't take this the wrong way. I think this is such a superior book to Extremities, and I love Extremities. So from your, from, yeah, no, I think this is, at the end of the day, this is the best encapsulate version of what I think you do so well, which is, if I had to compare what you do to someone who's never read you, I'd say, well, she's kind of the Patti Smith of horror. And I mean that in the best possible light pushing boundaries, uh, <laughs> moving the goalposts way back, um, fearlessly going places, using kind of an algebra, whereas you're intentionally omitting information to get at the interesting sides of stories. Um, char you, you have an interesting approach to characters, which is very much, the characters are on stage at the same time the reader is. And what I mean by that is you don't overtell a character's motivations. And I find that fascinating because the the bulk of modern fiction actually is the opposite way. There's a lot of telling us how we should feel about characters, whereas you don't really seem to have an interest in leading the, the reader like that. No, I don't, because it's the, again, that's the conversation. And people will, readers will make of stories what they're going to make of them. And it will be far richer than anything that I could impose by saying, I, I try to be as true to a circumstance and to a character as I can, which means looking at them, deep, and it doesn't matter how fantastic or horrific the, their circumstances are, but just looking at them and going, what would it be like to be this person? What would it be like 
you have to have a certain amount of empathy as a writer to be able to create people who feel real because otherwise they're just cardboard characters or they're, they're, there's only one way to feel about them. Um, you and I had talked earlier before we started about how my true binging love now is the series Babylon Berlin. And there was a character in that series in the first season who's very, he's a corrupt and kind of shitty sort of brutal cop. But there are moments in the narrative where you see a completely different side of him. And it really feels uncomfortable because you're like, oh, I already made up my mind. This guy's a <laughs> dick. But, oh, he did a legit good thing. But did he do it for some other reason or is he actually... And it, it's like real life. You can have more than one reaction to a person or an event, or but especially a person. So I think... So you don't have a reaction to a person you know, with you. I'm sorry, you're breaking up there a little bit. Do you have me? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. I think you're okay now. A little, yeah. All right. Again, this, okay. the platform is pretty good about catching back up. So, um, so, uh, you know, on that length, can you talk a little bit about who excites you as a new artist today? Because I, I think that's so important that we know that there's a path forward because it's easy to live in nostalgia, right? But um, to especially hear from you would be meaningful. Sure. Like, uh, not just in, uh, you just mentioned a TV show, not just in literature, though I definitely want a few names in that. But w what are you watching? What do you listen to? What, what What's exciting to you today? Um, I'm, I'm loving Babylon Berlin. I also loved the series Dark, which I recommend to everybody. It's beautifully written, beautiful narrative. And what is interesting to me as a writer in seeing these narratives is how novelistic they are because they're they have the room they have the arc they have the space to really explore a character and a story beautifully that a movie is going to be constrained by its you know runtime these are series they can go and go so i anything that has really good writing is going to pull me along um a writer who I'm loving right now is, her name is Maurice Meyer, M-E-I-J-E-R. And her, her first book is called Heartbreaker. It's a collection of short fiction. It's not like anybody else. Her voice is not like anybody else's. And she has a book coming out this fall called The Seventh Mansion that is anyone who appreciates dark, fiction could read this and enjoy it and just be blown away by it um it's a very audacious and yet very simple premise and i won't ruin it or spoil it but it's called the seventh mansion and you should do yourself a favor and read it um who am i listening to i'm listening to a lot of uh, I'm listening to a lot of techno right now, a ton of techno. Partially that's because I'm a project, a narrative project called Dark Factory, and it takes place in a club. And so I'm listening to a lot of Berlin techno and Detroit techno, um, the, the more hardcore Trezor kind of techno. And when that's a genre, I think too, that's, very straight and then if you're a devotee you can tell the difference and if you can't it's like ah <laughs> oh, it's all this four on the floor noise it's just this noise but if you listen to it if you listen to a lot of different artists you start seeing all these you know rich flavorings in it's very hard too. it's very hard it's very fast it's very loud so that is that's getting me through the day <laughs> There is nothing wrong with hard and fast and loud at all. That's so, so I find that artists don't, most artists, even if they're known for one thing, have more things going on that they're exploring. 
whether it's graphic arts or whatever. Now, you've done a lot of theater directing and writing for the theater, sometimes adapting your own work. But I was fascinated and kind of heartbreak and broken that I didn't get the opportunity to ever see what... Can you explain what you did with Dracula for the stage? Because seeing that you did an oh, ad Dracula adaptation, yeah, why wasn't this filmed? Why, why can I not experience this? <laughs> Well, because as an immersive performance, um, again, it's very much like my fiction. Um, because it's immersive, it is happening all around you, right, all at once. And to impose film on it, you are necessarily imposing a viewpoint. You are necessarily putting the viewer's perspective and their eyeballs on one thing at a time. And the whole point of the tagline for my version of Dracula was appetite must be fed. And it took place in the basement of an old mercantile building in Detroit called the Izzy. It's a very cool building and friends of mine own the building. And so I and a creative team recreated the space, the underground space as this area where you would be coming in to have dinner with Dracula and in the two giant shop windows out front were Renfield in his cell um, crazy to get out of there and Lucy the vampire Lucy and her valet her bride of Dracula uh, getting ready for the dinner and people were brought in off the street to this little vestibule where they were between these two shop windows and could watch these two narratives happening at the same time. So if you were filming that, you would have to either go back and forth or pick one or the other. And that was completely left up to the patrons. And I chose them by a system of my own to decide who could enter when. And they were taken downstairs by the Brides of Dracula and the dinner began. And I placed them along a long table and in each of the acts or movements of the dinner, moved them closer and closer to where Dracula was sitting. And the, the narrative was about Jonathan Harker coming to dinner with Dracula and we had a, a chef create a vegan meal that was set out on platters and plates, but no one ate it because they're vampires. <laughs> and Jonathan Harker got an empty plate and it was a lot of fun to make. And it was a lot of fun to watch people experience it every night because every night something different would happen. And with that, you just made and everyone watching this non, ever again jealous mm -hmm. that they didn't get the experience. Non-gender-based casting. It was great. It was real. It was, and because I got to rewrite, I got to re-emphasize what I found important in the Dracula narrative. I completely cut out Van Helsing because I have never liked him, and I had no interest in his faux Christianity and his I gone. He's an irrelevant so character. So that was kind of great too. He's an irrelevant character anyway because I mean it's the story is thematically about old Europe invading the advancing new Europe. That's the fear that we're going to go back to feudal Europe. It only makes sense if the American, the cowboy is the one that kills Dracula. I mean, because that's the new world. Right, that's Quincy, the next step. Right. So to me, Van Helsing is a red herring at best and an irrelevant character, most likely, which is why it kind of pisses me off every time I see a film adaptation and they fetishize the character because who cares? And, and, you know, yeah, I don't get it. The America doesn't even get screen time usually. And, and two, the so much of what what's interesting about Dracula as a book too is how well that story is told. And I mean, it is very immersive even as a text because you're getting the story through you know the wax cylinders of the doctor and through the bills of lading and through letters and through newspaper clippings he did a really fantastic job of pulling this narrative together out of all these disparate elements which 
is a very modern way to, you know, to piecemeal out a text. Have you ever considered a epistolary novel for yourself? Have you ever considered? No. no. I mean, I would never say never, but I've never gone down that road. No, that lettery road. No, and I, I, I'm very interested in different ways to make a narrative work, but I don't want it to call attention to itself, which in Dracula totally does not. Um, another book that explodes that kind of, and one of my favorite books in the world, which is totally a horror novel, is Wuthering Heights. Um, Wuthering Heights is all about, I mean, that book is so hardcore. Not only does everybody in that book believe in ghosts, they just take it as a matter of course that the dead walk the earth, right? It's like not a thing. And it's so completely dangerous and you have no idea who's going to make it out of that thing alive. And when, and I've read the book, I don't know how many times through my life, but I don't remember how old I was when I finally realized, oh my God, the narrator of this book could be total bullshit and she could be <laughs> shaping this narrative and she's lying. What if she's lying? Oh my God, this changes everything. And then you have to go back and look at everything again. Um, I'd had a discussion with someone about Haunting of Hill House and saying, if you think of Eleanor as the villain, that whole book changes. Instead of thinking of her as a victim, if you think of her as a villain, uh, wow, everything changes. I so, think that... I think Shirley Jackson would agree with that because I think that's kind of what uh, we've always lived in the castle kind of presents in many ways. Um, it's the other side. No, the well, no, but I'm saying, but I think that Shirley Jackson follows it up with almost what you're saying, that taking the unreliable narrator to even a greater level. Um, but so. And I've always, and that's a, that, oh God, what a book though, right? What a book. Yeah. And Maricat is so indelible. What an indelible character. I, I still haven't seen the film adaptation that came out last year, and I keep kicking myself. I don't know why I'm avoiding it. I think I'm afraid if it's not successful. Um, I think, I don't know. I need to buy it. I have seen it, but I won't. I won't. I won't. Yeah, do it. Do it. You it's won't, okay? I mean, you won't be sorry. You won't hurl yourself off a cliff or anything. Um, I don't know that anything anyone has ever done has or is going to match the intensity of what she does. I mean, Stephen King's very famous, you know, she never had to raise her voice, but it's absolutely true. She never has to raise her voice. She can do things in very quiet and deadly ways that just scare the bejesus out of you. Um, there's a part in Hill House, and I've read that book multiple times, but I remember reading it sitting on my own bed upstairs at like 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And I got to a certain point in the novel and my husband walked in and I screamed and threw the book across the room. <laughs> I've read this a million times, but she can do that. Good. So what's the future for you? I know you're working on Dark Factory, right? Yes, so I am. Um, Dark Factory is a narrative that's taking place on a lot of different levels at once. And I'm working on combining it so it can be experienced virtually as well, um, especially now in our current circumstances, which are so fraught and so uncertain. I want as many people as will be interested in the narrative to be able to, to be part of the narrative and take part of the narrative and working in immersive performance has shown me how powerful that is when people are, it's having that conversation and it's having it in real time. So I want to introduce that to this, or I am introducing it to this project, but it has taken a minute. So <laughs> the book itself is almost done. And I do have a Patreon for my immersive fiction, Dark Factory. So if you want to follow and support me, that would be wonderful. I would appreciate it very much. And I really want to do things with fiction like, you know, 
like innovators like Bronte, like Stoker, like Jackson, people who have made made it new. I want to try to do that with the work that I'm doing as well. So that is gonna that and the the cipher reprint is going to be my 2020 and most of my 2021. So assuming we all live through the plague and that everything is okay. Somehow I think we're going to get through it. Somehow I think we're going to get through. We have to get through it because we, 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 if we don't, we'll get through it. (laughs) Well, but well, I'm going to live through it. If nothing else to read dark factory. I mean, that's just how it is. (laughs) Uh, So at the beginning of every one of my videos, there's a description of the horror genre. And I think you're a perfect example of it because too often the, genre gets thought of by people who don't really explore it as just scary stuff or gory stuff. And, you know, uh, fear, anxiety, disgust, paranoia, terror, stress, gallows, humor. Those are the examples I give, but it also ends with etc. I believe any dark emotion can form the basis of a horror story or horror narrative. I see grief increasingly being used in very successful works, like the film Hereditary, for instance. The overall emotion is not fear that it's evoking. It is a deep exploration of grief. Why do you think at the moment we're seeing so so much work kind of go in that direction rather than the traditional scare? Grief is a very complex emotion. Um, And I think we, as a culture, as a Western culture, as an American culture, which is the one I live in and am familiar with, it's the only one I can speak to, uh, we have sustained in this country some unprecedented loss of identity and certainty because of the political situation that we're in. And that's been compounded by a factor of 10 by the pandemic. And we're going to see that come out in people's narrative, the way glass comes out of your face when you've been in a car wreck, because sometimes the pieces go in so deep that they have to grow out. They can't be, this happened to a friend of mine. Um, The glass goes in and, and and there's no way to reach it without just to grow out and then you can reach it. Um, I think it's very wise to say that grief can be the ground of terrible, terrible things, horror and terror in particular. I mean, look at something as simple as the monkey's paw, right? A little, just an old trope tale. But yeah, it's about you can't go back the dead have moved on, you can't bring them back because if you do, nothing good can come of that. You cannot go backwards. You have to go forwards. You have to live through your grief. You have to let the glass grow out of your face. And that kind of gets back to, yeah, well, that's the, it, it, this, these shows always go real happy places, but um, that kind of goes back to, you know, the scariest thing that Lovecraft always talked about, which is that, you know, the scariest thing is that it's a cold, heartless universe. Once the ultimate horror is that sure. the universe doesn't really care about us. So I always go in my example. It's funny you mentioned Monkey's Paw, which is like probably going to be my note go to. I'm going to completely steal it from you. But I've always said like, and you kind of touched on this before, uh, Beloved by Toni Morrison to me is a stone cold horror novel. It's about, it's about racism. It's about reconstruction. But I mean, the novel opens with a ghost tossing the family pet around the living room. And the two older brothers leaving. Um, the central, the name character may be ghostly on some level, <laughs> but for some reason, societally, we don't like like to embrace the idea of horror for something that's serious. There's, ser- there's a serious narrative about a serious topic, right. so they resist calling it horror. We got to change that, I think, because the genre has a lot to offer. And the same, well, the same way we had, had talked before, too, about comedy being the comic and the horrifying are both cathartic. And comedy also does not get respect, right? If, if 
you're a comic actor, you know, you're never going to get the respect that you would get if you were doing like, quote, a serious dramatic turn. Um, they both are, they're the genres that go for the lizard brain, right? They go for the place where you're undefended. You can laugh at something and I'm, everyone has had the experience that of the inappropriate laugh, you know, the laugh at the funeral, the laugh in the middle of a terrible fight, whatever. You can't help it. It's surprised out of you. It's like a scream and it releases the same kind of energy. Um, I believe that there are a lot, I mean, the same way I talked about Maurice Meyer, her work could be classified as horror. Cormac McCarthy, his great novel, Blood Meridian, is absolutely a horror novel. Absolutely. And Outer Dark, too. Outer Dark is one of the greatest horror novels ever written. And the for, for people who might not know it, it's a very short book that gives us this really dysfunctional, is at the is putting it mildly, this incredibly dysfunctional incestuous brother and sister. And she has their child. The brother gives it to a passing tinker and tells her it's dead. And she's like, Isn't it? my baby's not dead. And she goes after this tinker and he goes after her. And then we see these three incredibly murderous marauders are the other half of the story. And you see as it alternates, these people are going to intersect. These three are going to come across these poor idiots. And God, what is going to happen? The tension is unbelievable. It's and that is absolutely it's operating at the at the edges of the strange and the edges of awful deeds. And of course, it's a horror novel. Of course, it is. So maybe that the name horror is, has turned into an Achilles heel that we don't need. Maybe it's vestigial at this point. Do you think it would be better just to move past it and just uh, enjoy the dark narratives wherever they come? Or do you think it is important to have a sense of community around the horror genre? I don't know. It's really hard. I think a community of like-minded, you know, readers and, and writers and artists is really important to any literature. To, and that's going to assemble itself. Um, I don't know. I'm the wrong person to ask that question because I don't, my own work has ranged throughout so many different genres and that's what Velocities has. And I've been really gratified that people have said, oh, you know, this is a, it has horror fiction in it, but it also has historical fiction and it's gothic and it, it has, there's a YA aspect to it. And it's like, well, this is basically a Kathy Koji book. It's the Kathy Koji genre and in a lot of different ways. And I think all fiction, good fiction, is going to create its own genre. And you can, I don't know that horror needs to be pejorative. I don't think it should be. I think that the, the best part about genre is, and I found this with the cipher and I was very grateful. Um, if you are a reader of a particular genre, you will give a new voice a chance because it's like you're on, you're in, in fields where I like to play and I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and I'm going to play with you and see if we can play well together. And that's, that's irreplaceable for a new writer to be able to access readers who are willing, you know, to, to play along, even though they don't know you. That's great. So I would hate to see any genre lose that. And I mean, and that's the same, that's with any kind of art form, you know, I like techno. Well, if you like techno, you might like this. It's, should we do away with the name techno? No, but does, does everything have to, does everything have to wear the same t-shirt to be a horror novel? No, of course not. But is it still good to have an umbrella, a catch-all term? Yeah, probably. Probably so. So in my research for you, which, um, you know, I, I already had your fiction in my head, but I, I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything about you. I found something that I, I was really surprised by, and I would not. I would not have pegged. Um, and maybe it's not accurate, 
because, you know, I found it online. So one of your influences was listed as the original Night of the Living Dead. Oh, and I just yeah. don't oh, see yeah. it. I don't see it in your work. So I'm interested. Oh, that no, that I saw that film uh, way back in the day. And actually, that is the film that taught me everything I ever needed to know about authority and the proper reaction to authority. You go through this entire film with these people, especially with the hero. He does everything right. He is, he prevails in circum unbelievable circumstances. And he's shot dead at the end by a cop. It blew me out of the water. I could not believe that. And I mean, to this day that Romero had the nuts to do that. I think that's astonishing. That's a brilliant film. And seeing it at a very young age, I imprinted on it. And so absolutely that it has served me well through life to put me in the proper position of skepticism to all authority, even when you do everything right. And I was a kid when I saw it. So the racism of the white cop shooting the black hero went over my head, but I certainly saw it later. And huh. It's so interesting that Romero didn't write the role intending it for it to be a racial metaphor, but during the casting, it, it came about. And it definitely has an immense power because yeah. of that. But it's, it's just interesting. That film is lightning in a bottle. It really is. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. You talked earlier about, like, we are always on Ben's side throughout that entire film. And the irony, of course, right. is that his idea to stay on the ground floor is ultimately not where he ends up. He ends up having to do what Mr. Cooper thinks is right. He ends up in the basement. So right. it's, 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 it's not a matter of, I think, right. so much him being right or not. It's that he's righteous. He's the guy who doesn't need to take care of Barbara, but he does. When she goes hysterical, he does the right thing. I know slapping her probably feels pretty harsh, especially in 1969. But he brings her back from a place that she can't be. Right. So I think he's a righteous character um, and a selfless character, though he's tough. Oh, absolutely. He's not going to throw himself on the line for strangers who won't listen. But by the same rate, like when they do the raid you know, for, the, for the gas, he's the leader. He's the guy, you know? Um, so I just found it very interesting that uh, Knight would be. And he's, that, and he's very, he's incredibly intelligent. He's the person you follow. And yeah, and to see him meet that fate at the end was so shocking and so correct that was completely correct but it was truly shocking and that and that's how you know too that you're in the presence of a real piece of art is that it's completely true to itself and it's not afraid to do what it has to do and that was not put in there to be you know what i mean that is that's how that film should end that's how that narrative should end that's completely correct but wow wow yeah, it's, well, it's a huge influence. Yeah. So, I mean, I always say to people that in the 60s, two films came out that changed the genre on film anyway, massively. Um, that's Psycho and Night of the Living Dead. And the reason I say that is before that, the horror always came from outside. It invaded the society. Both those yeah. films suggested that the horror wa was either inside the society already or was the society. And Night is probably the even more disturbing ending than Psycho. Because instead of the boy next door being yeah. Oh, yeah. A, a psychopath, it turns out the whole society can be led to madness. They can be all out there in the fields as zombies, but they can also just be hunting people thinking that they're doing a service. Um, I think I don't think the horror genre up to that right. point really had had such a strong inward look. They didn't they weren't holding the mirror up to ourselves up to that point. But then once those two films happened. It almost feels wrong to feel like the horror comes from outside now. It almost feels like a cop out. You know what I mean? It, it horror feels Unless more intimate. It's so, but that's kind of the premise of the cipher, 
And I realized I have this incredibly boring blank wall behind me when I could have <laughs> these puppets behind me. I have these super cool puppets from one of my shows um, from Under the Poppy. So I'm going to lean on them for the duration here. This is a, a six foot anatomically correct horse headed puppet. And he was put to amazing service in that show. Um, for people who might not know, I have written a trilogy of books set in a Victorian brothel um, with a puppeteer and his partner and lover um, are the main, it, it's a love story, but it's also about war and art and all kinds of stuff. And I did a immersive production of that. And this is where this horse puppet comes from. So, so was that specifically based yeah, on that's the, what the cipher? Was Hmm? Oh, go ahead. I did, I'm going to derail you. So go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, no, uh, no. That, I, but that's the, that was the cipher is kind of an, it starts out at least as a completely outer directed, you know, here's this unexplained thing on the floor of this storage room and it's never explained and it never needs to be explained. I have had people for years ask, why don't you do a sequel of, you know, Nicholas goes down the hole. I would never do that. I, the only way that story could be extended would be to, to tell the whole story again through Nakota's eyes. And that might be a journey worth taking sometime, but. But isn't that story though? It's it, to me, that's like the story is what the fun hole does, what it influences it, what it, it teases out of people, but I don't feel like it's a completely foreign influence. It's more like a magnifying glass. Again, it's that mirror thing, right? The char char characters um, become the worst version of themselves in a way. Is that fair? Well, you know, my interpretation is just my interpretation. Any any reader's interpretation is just as valid as mine. And I don't, you know, say that to be coy. I believe that it's whatever, whatever. I think that's the allure of the whole fun hole story is there is this, this thing is nothing but other, whatever it might call out of you or whatever your response might be is immaterial to the fact of its existence. It's not, you know, and that's why I think sometimes it gets um, brought into the Lovecraft umbrella. And just for the record, I'm not a Lovecraft fan. I've never been a Lovecraft fan. Um, not leaving aside his own Lovecraft as a person, that fiction is just not for me. I do not have receptors for that. But I can see where people would feel this is a thing that's about as explicable as you know the uncaring universe there's this giant fucking hole in the floor and nobody knows where it came from and nobody knows what it does and you can either take its own terms or not there it is it doesn't care it really doesn't care all right so i'm going to um Go to what we're doing next week. And on the other side, if you want to let people know where they can reach you and give any parting thoughts. So maybe get the receptors into that for a absolutely. second. Absolutely. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. Um, I would invite everybody on earth to read Velocities. Absolutely. If they have the receptors for it. And um, yes, you can find me on Twitter at Kathy Koja or go to kathykoja.com. And I have, um, you can reach me through there. I have news is there. Um, if you want signed copies of some of my, like scan, some of the Abyss books are still there. And on Patreon, um, where Dark Factory is living. And I am very reachable and highly interactable. I like talking to people about work, not necessarily just because it's mine, I like talking to people who have receptors for my work because a lot of times we have receptors for the same thing. So I have, I like to interact with people. So don't be shy. If you want to talk to me, talk to me. 
Yeah, I reached out to Kathy. She responded very, very quickly. So she's not bluffing. Um, all right. So let no, me run a promo. Totally I'm going to run a promo for next week. And then on the other side, we'll get back together to say goodbye. And uh, here we go. All right. So I want to thank you for coming uh, in today and uh, talking with us for a, a little bit under an hour. Uh, Kath, you have been an amazing influence for me. Uh, I think you're one of the most important voices we've had in horror over the last half century, to be honest with you. And I think it's in, impossible to underestimate where your work is going to influence people going forward. You're exactly what I think the genre needs desperately and not just the genre, your work outside of the field is equally important. Of course, my love will always be in the darker fiction. So that's where you're always going to have affected me the most, but you are an amazing artist, a great person, and you're about the most true and honest being walking among us. So thank you so much for coming out. I know that the, uh, the chat was very lively tonight with people discussing your work. And some people said they saw your live shows. So know that we're out there and we love what you do. We love nice. you. Have a great Thank night. You. Thank you for having me. Thank you for meeting me. And thanks. Thank you, people. See you soon. See you Saturday. He's a very old guy, knows a lot about horror.